for coming. Um, we have, I've been, I mentioned earlier in some of my emails, I've been tapping into uh, some of the other scholars I know outside of the normal community that we see with the World War I Historical Association and the Western Front Association uh, to try to tap into other topics. Uh, we will still be having, if, if I can find them, uh, speakers on the military aspects of the war, which people really enjoy. I know we had the talk last time on the Christmas truce in 1914. Uh, and that was really useful for me because I'm teaching a class this semester on the World Wars, and I just did the Christmas truce last week. Uh, and that talk really improved, I think, and informed much of my talk to my students. Uh, but talk today is somebody I've been communicating. We've been emailing each other back and forth and exchanging books for some years now. Mm -hmm. um, I know him as Harry. Uh, who is an independent scholar and one of the experts on the intelligence war in the United States during the period of American neutrality. Uh, and he and Charles Harris III, who's a emeritus professor down in what's it, New Mexico. Yeah. He and his former partner who's now passed away, uh, Dr. Sadler, were the experts on the U.S. and the Mexican Revolution and the border war and all the multi-sided spies and smugglers and what have you running back and forth. Um, but now Harry stepped in and they have a multi-volume series coming out uh, on the Bureau of Investigation, which it doesn't become the FBI till the 1930s, but the early FBI and the intelligence war. Um, I have a, a early copy of his first book here. I think it's out formally now, uh, but I have the one oh, copy. Um, and I asked him to come talk to us about German efforts, uh, sabotage, spying, what have you, in the U.S. during our period of neutrality. Because he has found, he and Dr. Harris have found some really interesting information that contradicts what people have been kind of assuming happened for many, many decades. Uh, that's always the nice thing about going into the archives and finding a whole bunch of records nobody has noticed before, is sometimes there's some really, really interesting stuff in there. Um, so, um, Harry, I made you co-host, so you should be able to share the screen with the PowerPoint, if you wish. Yes. And if nobody objects, we are going to record this. There we go. I'm having an issue with this panel. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Can everybody see this? I can. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's an honor uh, to speak to you. Um, um, so uh, in the military history realm, of course, uh, there's a lot uh, said and done already about uh, World War I. And uh, so my specialty um, is really to look at um, intelligence uh, history and uh, especially uh, the time period of the Mexican Revolution and um, World War I. And um, uh, this is an area that has, um, like Mark said, has either not been studied very much or is based on um, still lingering British uh, propaganda <laughs> that made it into scholarly works and, uh, and seems to permeate uh, the historiography. So um, uh, as, as Mark knows and, and, and uh, cherishes as well, um, I uh, really go back to archival documents and try to find out what really happened using just primary sources. And um, more often than not, um, this story uh, comes out differently than it's been portrayed. Uh, so um, 
if you um, just in general, if you allow me to organize this, I want to give you an overview of um, what was going on from the intelligence side in the United States um, in the neutrality years, uh, maybe up to 1918. Um, and uh, the way I wanted to structure this is I wanted to give you just a, uh, a brief uh, overview of the strategies um, that uh, Germany was pursuing in the United States and why the United States or, or North America, I have to include Mexico in this, um, actually played a significant role in the war. Um, so, um, so with that, I wanted to then uh, just introduce to you some of the characters which are fascinating who are fascinating um some of the characters in this intelligence game um and then uh give you some uh cases um some uh things that happened in this time period um in the intelligence war um that you may or may not um, have known about um you can of course um ask me questions afterwards uh, Mark, uh, you said about 45 minute presentation, 40 minute presentation, something like that. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, let's let's start with, um, let me see here. That's this weird panel here. Okay, here we go. Let's start with, um, first of all, why did the United States play such a large role um, in the beginning of World War I when it broke out in Europe? And one of the main reasons was um, uh, the situation uh, of the Atlantic Ocean. So um, President Wilson on August 19, 1914 um, declared to Congress or in front of Congress that the United States uh, would be neutral in this conflict. Um, he said that uh, we have to be neutral in fact as well as in name and uh, should be impartial in thought as well as in action. And uh, so this promise to stay neutral um, was in the end uh, the underlying reason for the United States entering the war on the side of the Allies when this neutrality um, was not um, possible anymore because of um, German um, commerce war, submarine war, and also threats to American national security uh, through sabotage and bombings uh, here in the United States. So um, how did the Germans view this uh, promise of neutrality? It turned out quite different um, for uh, Germans. So um, the Germany had uh, not anticipated to be completely cut off from supplies. In fact, they had um, uh, quite a uh, large com commercial fleet um, that uh, in the beginning of the war then had to intern itself. Uh, so U.S. harbors on the East Coast and West Coast were literally full of German ships and German sailors. Um, and so what uh, Germany had expected, that somehow the United States would allow trade to continue, um, even if uh, Great Britain um, you know, would, would blockade um, warships and so forth. And that really did not happen. Almost immediately when the war started, um, the British sea blockade cut off um, Central Europe from shipping, and um, any ship that wanted to go through had to uh, be stopped. It went to Falmouth um, uh, and was searched, and um, the searches uh, resulted in impounding of so-called contraband. The list of contraband um, went from ammunition and guns and, uh, you know, the obvious uh, things that have to do with war, but then started including cotton, started including foodstuffs. And um, so in, in the end, um, it was really um, a full blockade. And the, Germany viewed the stance of the United States as not neutral in the sense that um, American uh, um, businesses were selling arms and ammunition uh, to anybody, but of course only the Allies could bring them to Europe. Germany could not do that. And so um, by the end of 1914, beginning of 1915, the United States became um, hugely important for the war effort of the Allies, um, especially for England supplying a majority of the munitions and arms uh, there. So um, what did Germany do then as a reaction? How did they deal with that fact? Um, so you had 
um, basically um, several issues that uh, could be abused or used. Uh, one, of course, was the Mex Mexican Revolution. Uh, so Mexico at that time, uh, 1914, was in turmoil. Um, just before the war started in Europe, um, uh, the dictator uh, or usurper to the presidency, Victor Yanahuata, was defeated. And um, a civil war between two major factions in the Mexican Revolution, Pancho Villa and uh, Veneciano Carranza, uh, broke out. And uh, so it unsettled the border tremendously. Lots of refugees, also incursions. And um, as we see later on, um, uh, serious uh, violations of, of uh, U.S. security. Um, so what Germany was looking at in the beginning as goals was uh, the most important one uh, in the beginning of um, the war was to supply the remaining fleet uh, that was um, in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. And uh, for that, um, they sent uh, the, the, um, the Minister of War, uh, sent $1.2 million in today's money that would be um, times 21, right? so it would be like $30 million or so, uh, to the United States, uh, to the naval attaché here, to start um, supplying the fleet with coal, with uh, food and so forth. And that, of course, that activity was clandestine. Uh, it's a clear violation of neutrality. Um, so what um, the way they did that was basically purchasing supplies, uh, leasing ships, and then smuggling under false manifests uh, these supplies into the um, into the middle of the ocean where they meet up with uh, German warships and they would transfer the load and then return back to harbor. Um, so um, that effort um, went on not just off the coast of the United States, but also off the coasts of Mexico and South America and um, uh, did not last very long. As uh, you probably know, the German fleet did not survive very long. Uh, the Battle of the Falklands was the last major battle and after that, um, there was really no fleet left. Um, but while this was going on, um, uh, the, the British side, um, of course, saw this happening and uh, immediately tried um, for the United States to stop this. And, um, and they did. Um, interestingly, uh, the people involved in this um, falsifying of manifests um, was the company HAPAC, mostly HAPAC. Um, so the Hamburg... Um, uh, uh, big um, uh, uh, shipping uh, corporation. Um, they were the ones that were doing the leases and the false manifesting. And um, in fact, uh, their senior managers ended up going to trial and um, were sentenced to prison. Uh, the CEO of uh, HAPAC uh, United States or HAPAC North America actually died in an American prison in Atlanta. So supplying the fleet was a very, very important um, initial um, effort and um and so um that went on only until the fall of 1914. then of course you had propaganda um the british had cut the transatlantic cables so there was really no war news coming out of central europe all the news went through england to the united states um, or most of the news and so uh the germans uh in in the united states the people in the uh, embassy were scrambling to come up with um, a counter effort um, for propaganda. Um, it was quite sluggish uh, when they started it um, and uh, not very good, um, but uh, that changed uh, within about a year. And then this whole propaganda offer effort, of course, uh, totally died after the sinking of the Lusitania, which uh, produced a huge outcry in the American public. And, um, and I will talk about that um, a little further. Hurting the enemy, of course, uh, another effort, uh, another uh, goal. Um, the enemy in, in the sense that, of course, the Allies sent out uh, buyers immediately when the war started all over the U United States. And so um, the German um, uh, clandestine team here was trying to figure out what were they trying to buy and try to buy it faster, you know, get weapons uh, and munitions bought up and then sell them off to a neutral country like Mexico. Um, also hurting the enemy were attacks on Canada. So Canada, of course, was um, part of the British Empire. And so 
um, immediately uh, in the fall of 1914, already in September 1914, uh, German agents um, attacked installations in Canada. Um, they tried to blow up the Welland Canal, uh, which was a strategically important supply line um, going uh, between Lake Erie and Lake, um, I guess it's Lake Ontario. Um, so moving troops and so forth to the east coast of Canada had to go through this canal moving supplies. So that was one. Um, they also attacked railroad bridges of the uh, Pacific Canadian Railroad, again, for the same purpose. And there was also a plan to sink barges in the St. Lawrence River so that uh, uh, the Canadian troop ships couldn't leave. All that ended basically a month later in the um, I think it's around the uh, 10th of October, so it was 6th of October when the entire Canadian expeditionary force left um, to Europe. And um, as you probably know, uh, to a great success, about 600,000 troops, Canadian troops fought in Europe, and the Germans could not prevent to um, prevent them getting there. Um, blockade running, again, that was an effort to uh, see how they can, how the British blockade can be um, uh, broken. And uh, so, what um, the, uh, what the Germans did is they would buy things that were, um, uh, you know, not really contraband, but uh, on the edge, um, and challenging uh, British um, uh, search searchers to. Uh, stop it, and um, and they would buy large insurance um, insurances on these on these on this freight, and uh, so um, they actually finance a lot of the operations with insurance payments that they got um, for um, running into um, the the um, Falmouth Harbor and and having their loads uh, taken away. And some uh, some were successful. Some blockade running efforts were successful. Uh, for example. Um, German uh, uh, agents would uh, lease a American, a neutral ship, and uh, they would send it um, to near uh, the, the German um, ocean, uh, near the German beaches, and um, and a German warship would then take them in and um, and uh, and keep the keep the freight. Um, shipping of recruits was another important uh, thing that they wanted to do. Um, if uh, you can imagine, there were many uh, Germans and German Americans that um, were on the uh, reserve officer list and uh, re reservists. Um, and so um, what they were hoping is at first they could just um, buy them uh, tickets on American uh, ships and send them to Europe. But of course, the British made that impossible. And so shipping recruits was uh, turned into a... Um, an effort to produce fraudulent passports or buy passports from American citizens and other neutral citizens, and um, and then basically travel under false names, change pictures out, and uh, that is of course uh, illegal. And uh, the people involved in that were caught, and um, uh, cost that cost a big scandal. Um, and I will show you some of the people involved with that in a minute. Um, finally, diverting arms and munitions. Um, so the idea was, if we can't ship munitions to Europe, then we can just buy them up and put them in warehouses um, and sell them off to other countries, for example, Mexico, but also supporting uh, anti-British movements elsewhere. So these arms and munitions that German agents bought up um, were shipped to India, for example, uh, where they tried to ship them to India. Um, there were efforts to support um, the Irish uh, liberation, also with arms and ammunitions. And um, so that was the initial strategy. And if you look at this list of what they were trying to do in 1914, is yes, there were some illegal things with it, um, you know, falsifying passports and attacking um, Canada from U.S. soil. This is, of course, not legal, but these are kind of um, not really um, issues that would threaten American national security. So Germans had hoped, the German uh, clandestine people in the U.S. had really hoped that the U.S. would kind of tolerate uh, those small transgressions. Um, then 
in 1915, things changed radically. So on February 1, 1915, Germany declared an un, um, um, unrestricted submarine warfare against all shipping. Um, so that included American ships. And um, they also sent uh, a whole a host of agents to the United States uh, to con conduct sabotage and to weaponize the Mexican Revolution um, against the United States, uh, to cause labor strikes, labor, labor unrest, um, and uh, in the end also really blow up factories and, and stop production here in the US. So the goals were uh, much more radical, um, cornering strategic industries, um, if you think about, um, there's a, um, one of the plots was called the Great Phenol Plot. So um, Bayer, um, which produces aspirin, um, uh, bought up uh, a year's worth of phenol, which can be used in or is used in producing um, uh, aspirin, but it also is used to produce uh, nitroglycerin and, and other explosives. And so um, that was was uh, one of the examples of how they were trying to corner strategic industries. Um, they also uh, did things like um, they found a hydraulics uh, company that uh, was basically the only company in the U.S. that would produce the heavy uh, duty presses that you need to produce cartridges. Um, so they would just buy up all the hydraulic presses. And so when um, Americans wanted to build more capacity for munitions, uh, they couldn't find these presses. Uh, sabotaging Allied shipping. Um, again, I'll get deeper into that, but um, there were um, uh, serious attacks on ships, um, not just by submarines, but also by firebombs, by timed firebombs. Um, the, the plot finally came to light uh, in 1916, but uh, by that uh, time already over 75 ships had uh, either sunk or been totally immobilized and ruined. And uh, so that was a, a serious um, um, national security issue. Um, and then, of course, sabotaging U.S. production. There's lots of examples where factories uh, were blown up or firebombed. Um, I've done a lot of detailed research into that because it's very, very hard to tell. Um, uh, if you think about, you know, here's some company that was producing um, uh, textiles before the war, and now is this profitable um, uh, munitions production comes along, so they change their plan to munitions. None of their workers have ever worked with explosives and uh, and uh, incendiary uh, things, and so many of the fires certainly could have been accidents, um, but uh, there are also quite a few examples where clearly uh, German firebombing was the reason for factories to burn to the ground. In 1915, the Roebling Cable Plant in uh, New Jersey, um, for example, was firebombed. Uh, they produced cables for underwater um, submarine protection for England and um, uh, tremendous fire. Um, uh, yeah, and so they, they actually rebuilt the factory and a year later, the Germans firebombed it again and burned it down again. <laughs> um, then, um, you know, also inciting a war between the US and Mexico. So this was, um, uh, I've written uh, two books about this. This was uh, quite something uh, that the United States was fearful of, um, but couldn't really put their finger on, you know, um, how exactly Germany would do that. But there was uh, um, a German agent responsible for this war strategy, and uh, he had uh, promised um, that he could actually create a military intervention in Mexico. Um, this plan was signed off by uh, Chancellor von bateman holweg so all, it went all the way to the top. I couldn't find the Kaiser signature on it, but I suppose he knew about it. And um, so uh, this agent uh, happened to be also responsible for handling Pancho Villa's weapons purchases. And so you may know in uh, March 1916, uh, Pancho Villa's forces of about 450 men attacked the little hamlet of Columbus, New Mexico, and uh, burned it to the ground. And uh, that caused this um, a large American military intervention um, under General Pershing. Um, basically, by the summer of 1916, the entire U.S. military, save for one division um, defending Washington, D.C., and the entire U.S. reserve was either at the Mexican border or in Mexico. Uh, so you can see that that strategy to weaponize the Mexican Revolution uh, definitely worked. 
um, fueling labor unrest, another strategy um, that, of course, made a lot of sense. Um, so uh, German agents would actually infiltrate the peace movement and infiltrate unions, in fact, started a labor union uh, financed by, um, you know, the clandestine coffers in New York. Um, and um, uh, again, it was a very uh, successful um, uh, strategy by uh, the summer. And in, in it started in 1915. In the spring, by the summer of 1915, um, the half, the Rust Belt, was on strike. And um, we can credit the uh, introduction of the 40-hour work week uh, to German agents of the time, because that's what uh, the American government had to, government had to uh, offer uh, to settle the strike. So um, very, very successful strategy. Um, and finally, again, sub subverting the peace movement. So um, um, that was just basically an internal opposition and uh, galvanized around William Jennings Bryan, uh, Secretary of State, who resigned in 1915 over the Lusitania notes. And um, uh, so he was basically a, um, a loud and, and clearly heard voice in, in U.S. politics um, advocating for peace. So those are um, basically the, um, that is an overview of what is happening here in the United States during the war in the clandestine war. So let me show you um, some of the people, um, I love to just um, show you people so you put faces and names uh, to uh, the actors. Um, so um, we have um, the first person I want to introduce you, of course, the German ambassador, Johann Heinrich Count Bernstorff. Um, he um, was already ambassador to the United States uh, since 1908. So he had been in the United States, his wife um uh was american so he was uh, um you know understood the united states very well um ended up um going on vacation um like he did every summer in the summer of 1914 and um had to rush back to washington as the war had started uh with new orders and uh, he's often credited for being in charge of clandestine operations in the united states um, but I think uh, that is actually overblown. I'm sure he knew uh, some things, um, and uh, but he maintained plausible deniability at all times. And, um, and so a lot of the actual uh, work and planning and financing was done by other people. And I introduce those to you in a second. So um, the second person that uh, I would like to show to you is um, Franz von Papen. Uh, Franz von Papen on the bottom right, um, you may know, um, uh, ended up being Chancellor of Germany and uh, is famous for having convinced um, German President Hinden, uh, Hindenburg that he could handle Hitler. Um, that was that was uh, you know very courageous of him. <laughs> Did not work, of course. Uh, Franz von Papen uh, was military attaché um, for both Mexico and the United States. And uh, in 1914, uh, moved his operation. So he was, when the war started, he was actually in Mexico, in Mexico City. Um, and um, so he rushed uh, to the United States and um, uh, started an office in New York, um, where he was basically throughout the time he was in the United States. And um, a um, interesting guy, um, very arrogant, um, party animal, lots of womanizing and things going on. Um, he um, was actually in charge of uh, financing attacks on Canada and collecting intelligence uh, for the U for the German military. And um, uh, the British um, finally were able to convince uh, the United States to expel him in um, December 1915 um, after some of the things came out uh, that he had um, undertaken. Um, his colleague, um, uh, Carl Boyed, um, was the naval attaché, um, also um, went, uh, when the war started, went to New York and established his office there. And um, naval attachés uh, in, uh, in, in German foreign policy played the role 
of running uh, clandestine services um, outside of uh, Germany. So the military attaché typically uh, did not have that responsibility. And so Karl Boyette was actually um, the real head of most of the spies that that uh, came to the United States and worked here. Um, for example, this German spy, uh, Felix Sommerfeld, that was in charge of creating a war between Mexico and the United States, uh, reported directly to Boyette, um, as well as uh, many of the sabotage agents and so forth. So uh, Boyette, a very interesting man, um, very highly regarded, actually. Um, he um, he had a, um, uh, a close relationship with the, with the U.S. Navy, um, also attended many of their functions before the war, um, was a highly regarded um, um, uh, captain. Um, and and uh, um, yeah, so um, the war destroyed his reputation, of course, and uh, he, just like Papen, uh, were expelled in 1915 and um, went back to Germany. And uh, honestly, after he went back to Germany, never amounted to anything. Afterwards, um, he um, was sick. He couldn't uh, sleep anymore. He um, had a problem with uh, eating, eating disorders, and died relatively early. Um, and uh, he was uh, sad to have suffered from the stresses of his wartime assignment to the point that um, he was just a wreck when he came back to Germany. Um, on the far left um, is Bernhard Danburg. So Danburg uh, came to the United States um, with um, the ambassador in, in August 1914. And um, he was in charge of selling war bonds. So the Germans had thought that in, to raise money for supplies and for clandestine operations, all you have to do is bring a few million dollars of war bonds and sell those uh, here in the United States. Uh, was a great plan, uh, but certainly didn't work out because uh, already in September 1914, it became clear that the Schlieffen plan had failed. Germany was in a two frontal war. Uh, stuck in Belgium, uh, couldn't even get into France. And uh, so uh, selling war bonds under those circumstances was not easy. And uh, so Dernberg basically couldn't sell these war bonds and um, uh, ended up being the person in charge of propaganda. And he did a really good job with that um, until the sinking of the Lusitania, um, which of course um, made all efforts to make Germany look good um, in vain. Um, he gave a speech uh, in Cleveland um, in the week after the Lusitania sinking, basically um, uh, saying that it's not our problem if some idiots travel on English ships. And uh, so as a result, he, um, the German government was um, notified by the US government um, to send him back home before they will throw him out of the country. And so he voluntarily went back to Germany um, his background is very interesting um, because he was, um, first of all, he was Jewish and he was in the inner circle of the German emperor. Um, Bernhard Derenberg is the first cabinet officer um, of the Prussian government uh, that was Jewish. Um, he was in charge of the colonies. Um, so he was a colonial secretary and therefore also had great connections all over the world. Uh, also, especially in Mexico and, and South America. Um, very interesting guy. Um, he, uh, um, you know, he he was the one, for example, that submitted the offer to create a war between Mexico and the United States by Sommerfeld. He transmitted that uh, to the highest echelons of the German government. And um, on the top left, you see um, this uh, man here. Uh, his name is uh, Heinrich Albert. And Heinrich Albert um, uh, was uh, at first the purchasing agent. So the, he came over around the same time that the, uh, that the um, German ambassador came back from Germany. Um, he also had offices in New York. Um, he worked for the so-called German purchasing company uh, under the auspices of HAPA, of this shipping line. Um, and in reality, he was actually the man that had the money. So he was the money man, um, the spy ring leader, and uh, so uh, Hoppen, Boyette, Danburg, everybody reported to him, and he paid for uh, whatever clandestine um, efforts they made. So, so um, uh, very interesting guy. Um, his background is um, uh, a legal 
background um, and uh, uh, spoke English quite well. He's been in the United States before um, in uh, the uh, world exhibit uh, exhibitions, 1900 and, and uh, um, 19, I forgot when the other one was. Um, so he um, knew the United States quite well. And, um, um, you know, there was really, it was an interesting guy too, because he looked like Mr. Everybody, right? So he walked down uh, the street in New York uh, with his little briefcase and nobody cared about him. Nobody knew what he was doing. And uh, that stayed um, like that until the summer of 1915, when um, poor Mr. Albert uh, fell asleep on the elevated train in New York City um, on, in, in, on a hot July uh, Saturday and um, woke up um, almost missed his um, his exit, but he woke up and ran out uh, of the elevated train and and left his briefcase behind. And um, so um, the briefcase um, disappeared. And I, I will talk about it a, a little bit later, but uh, it was one of the greatest scandals of World War One because for whatever reason, two weeks after Mr. Albert left his briefcase on the train, the contents of the briefcase graced the front pages of the New York world. Um, so he had in his briefcase details on financial support for editors of uh, large uh, New York dailies. Um, there was evidence of um, paying spies. Uh, there was uh, evidence of cornering industries. Uh, so he had the, the briefcase full of uh, stuff that um, you wonder why you would take that out of your office. Um, and in fact, the German government also wondered why he took that out of his office. He got in deep trouble. Um, they actually wanted to fire him and send him back to Germany. Um, but the British said, if he comes through us, uh, through here, then we'll arrest him. And so he stayed in New York. Um, and uh, the chan German chancellor finally changed. And so the new chancellor um, was not so angry with him. And uh, when Albert came back to Germany in 1917, uh, by then he was a commercial attaché, so he had diplomatic protection. And uh, so when he came back, he actually played a big role after the war in, in the Weimar Republic, became treasury secretary at one point, and then ran the all the business for Ford Corporation during World War II. So he made a great career um, out of his stay. Um, very interesting guy. Um, I, I'm particularly fond of him because I found his papers that were uh, lost. So about 25 years ago, I was in the National Archives looking for the contents of the briefcase. And um, after a few months of searching with archivists, um, we found 68 boxes of uh, information. Of course, that, uh, that would be even too much for a bulging briefcase. Um, so uh, what this was, was actually... Uh, all his financial records, uh, his letters. Um, he also had drafted a book about his wartime efforts. All that was in this collection. And um, uh, so that uh, was the basis for one of my books. Okay, so um, let's look at the other side um, and especially the British side. Uh, so the um, uh, Great Britain had um, the most clandestine efforts here in the United States. Um, and of course, the most important person, just like on the German side, is the naval attaché. So the naval attaché for the for Great Britain uh, was a man named Guy Archer Gaunt. Um, he um, was uh, also a, um, a captain of a, of a, uh, war vessels, um, but he had a little mishap, um, which was that um, he was um, sea trialing one of the newest. Um, ships um, that uh, a dreadnought that the British had built and he wrecked it. Um, he ran over some other ship uh, because he he um, didn't he wanted to make time or whatever it was. He got in deep trouble and uh, that earned him a position in the at that time you know uh, backwaters of the United States as a naval attaché. Um, uh, very smart guy. Um, I have uh, uh, meanwhile uh, researched him a lot and found a lot of. Uh, details on him. Um, also very subtle, um, uh, just like um, Albert kind of stayed below the radar. Nobody really knew much about him. Um, so, um, but he reported directly to um, 
uh, Blinker Hall, uh, the head of uh, intelligence uh, in, in England, and, um, and the Admiral Hall was, was his direct superior. Um, on the right, on the left, uh, you see um, John Ratham. Um, his real name was actually John Solomon. Um, he was Australian, um, and um, he was in charge of British propaganda in the United States. Uh, so Gaunt would pay him to publish articles, and this, this is one of the stranger stories of um, the World War, uh, namely that um, he was the editor in chief of the Providence Journal. Um, who in the world would know the Providence Journal, right? So um, uh, he was in Providence, Rhode Island, and he wrote um, um, articles. And um, and for some reason, and uh, the reason is, of course, Guy Gaunt, um, the New York Times and New York World and other large dailies would start publishing articles where it says in the first sentence, the Providence Journal will report tomorrow. So these were these were propaganda pieces inserted by the British government um, into um, the Providence Journal, and then they made sure that the rest of the world would be able to read this. Um, Ratham, uh, uh, a, a con man uh, of the first order, um, was later um, uh, forced by the U.S. Justice Department to admit that most of what he wrote about and uh, in, in during the war was lies. And um, he was totally discredited. Um, so that was that was him. Um, and then on the bottom here is a super interesting guy. His name is Emmanuel Bosca. Um, so the British did not have agents or many agents. They had, I'm sure they had some, but they really didn't have many agents in the United States. And so they were looking for manpower. And the manpower came from this guy, Bosca. Um, Voska was a um, Czech nationalist and um, was um, aligned with Masaryk, the first president of the independent um, uh, independent Czechoslovakia after the war. And um, Masaryk at that time was in London. And so he offered his services uh, to the British government, um, which, which was basically he had um, about 13,000 members in his um, Czech alliance. Um, and uh, in New York City alone, he operated 80 agents um, that literally were waiters, that were stenographers. Uh, some of them worked in the Austrian consulate because, of course, as a, many of the uh, Czech uh, uh, Czechs could speak German. Um, and, and so they could slide in as German speakers. And uh, so that was really the intelligence arm of the British government was uh, Voska. Uh, Voska in 1917, um, so he was American citizen, uh, in 1917 joined the military intelligence division um, and and uh, worked for it during the war uh, for MID. Um, and so maybe since we have now seen Albert's face and Voska's face, maybe I'll give you uh, just a quick rundown um, of this briefcase affair. So um, the briefcase, as we said, uh, as I told you, was stolen um, in July 1915. Um, and uh, Albert at first did not really know who did it. He thought it could be a common thief, but most likely it was the Brits. Um, and um, so the Germans actually heard that their papers, um, that Albert's papers made it to the New York world for publication. Um, so they sent one of their lawyers to none other than President Wilson himself to try to convince Wilson not to publish the papers. And um, uh, the effort failed. Um, President Wilson um, basically said that he doesn't care. Um, but that's how much the public knew. Basically, the papers appeared. Nobody knew where they came from. Um, however, in 1918, um, this um, American... Um, he's down here, um, American U.S. Secret Service chief. Uh, his name was um, uh, William Flynn. Um, William Flynn wrote a fictionalized autobiography in which he said that his people stole the briefcase. And, um, and then after he published that, the book actually became super uh, successful, was turned into a movie. And um, so after uh, the movie came out and he promoted this, 
Um, he actually then became the chief of the BI, of the Bureau of Investigation. And um, he then put a name to uh, the agent that actually stole the briefcase. His name was Frank Burke. And Frank Burke, uh, if you read anything, you can go on online to the US Secret Service website. Um, you can see um, how uh, he's everywhere named as the guy that stole the briefcase. As it turns out, um, from my Charles and my latest research, um, it was not uh, the U.S. Secret Service, uh, and it was not Burke. It was actually Voska or Voska's men that stole the briefcase and um, and got them published. And so this is a huge story. Um, uh, it, it will rewrite the history of the uh, U.S. Secret Service counterintelligence mission um, once once our paper gets published. Um, yeah, so uh, here are a few others. Um, uh, the third side, of course, the American side. Most importantly, Alexander Bruce Belaski. You can see him on the bottom right. Um, he looks like a little boy. He is actually the chief of the BI, of the Bureau of Investigation. And believe it or not, uh, when he got the job in 1912, he was 29 years old. So he was actually a young man. Um, uh, by the way, uh, J. Edgar Hoover in 1924, when he became chief, of the BI also was 29 years old. They had that in common. Um, so Belaski, a lawyer, um, a very um, successful uh, college football player, um, ran the BI throughout the war and um, uh, incredible uh, man, very successful, uh, built the BI from basically a good idea to uh, the number one counterintelligence intelligence agency the US government had. Um, at the, in the middle, you see William Offley. William Offley, superintendent of the BI, ran the New York field office, the largest field office of the BI. Again, he was involved in um, finding out about all this German intrigue. Um, and then, of course, we have William Flynn. I already talked about him. U.S. Secret Service chief until 1917. Got fired for insubordination. Um, had to make some money, wrote a book, made a film, and then rehabilitated himself and became BI chief one of the most corrupt uh, chiefs the BI ever had. Um, and then at the top, um, interesting guy, Thomas Tunney. And Tunney was the head of the New York bomb squad. And uh, so Tunney was the one that was investigating the ship bombings, for example, these fire bombs that were sent, set off. And, um, uh, you know, he, he solved the issue. He cooperated closely with the BI um, and, um, uh, most of the perpetrators were found. So um, I think, Mark, I'm pretty much uh, out of time, right? Um, so um, maybe I will conclude by uh, showing you just some of the agents that uh, even the BI does, or the FBI today has forgotten um, that we found. Um, here is uh, uh, Herbert J. Herbert Cole. He ran the San Antonio uh, field office. That was the main office that had to deal with Mexican revolutionaries. Um, on the bottom, you have um, John Wren, um, who, if you see the um, no, new movie about the Osage murders, he's in that movie. He's pictured as an Indian guy with a uh, young guy with, uh, with uh, um, long hair and so forth. That's not what he looked like. Uh, but he was the first uh, Native American federal agent of the, of the FBI. Um, then we have John Van. John Van ran the Houston office, uh, field office. Um, we have um, up here, uh, uh, Harry Berliner, one of my favorite uh, agents. Um, he worked actually officially for the, uh, for the Oliver typewriting company. And uh, I always figured, couldn't figure out how, he, when he wanted to find information, he would just take people to a bar, offer them a cigar, invite them for a drink. And if you know anything about the FBI, that's hard to get through, right? You have to apply to invite somebody for a drink or whatever. So how did Berliner do it? He charged it to Oliver typewriters. <laughs> so that's how he financed all his drinking and, and smoking. But uh, he was a star agent. Um, they uh, sent him to Mexico. They sent him to Costa Rica. They sent him to uh, Columbus when the Columbus attack happened. Um, really interesting guy. The photo is actually from uh, given to me by his granddaughter. Um, who also had great letters and information on him. Um, uh, Agent Skull up here, um, for uh, a very interesting guy. Um, he's probably one of the most underrated agents that the FBI ever had. 
uh, Skull actually wrote a, um, so the way I found out about him is he worked in, um, in Texas, looking at waybills at railroads. So obviously one of the worst jobs you can get. Uh, and he was a top notch author. He actually published a very successful book called Lassoing Wild Animals in Africa. Um, he was personal friends with uh, Teddy Roosevelt and had um, stormed uh, Cuba together with uh, the Rough Riders. Uh, he was also a Harvard graduate. And um, so uh, looking at waybills in the southwestern deserts uh, didn't last very long. He went back to New York, became uh, assistant uh, police chief in New York. And uh, finally, Forrest Pendleton, a lawyer, he ran the New Orleans field office, also a really important office for the BI, a lot of um, information about uh, the Mexican Revolution, revolutionaries, Central American wars, um, gun running, all these things came together in New Orleans. And so he was uh, the man that uh, was in charge of that office and did a fantastic job. Um, yeah, so here are some German agents. Um, this guy here um, um, is uh, the guy that was uh, in, uh, responsible for uh, the passport frauds, Hans Adam von Wedel. Um, he actually fled, so he, the BI was after him. They didn't catch him. He went uh, to Europe. Um, the British uh, identified him and took him off the ship, and uh, the ship that they put him on to take him into Falmouth uh, hit a mine and sank and took Wedel with him, so he did not survive this. Um, another um, interesting guy um, that we have is, um, let's see here, up here, Horst von der Goltz. Um, this is the guy that was trying to blow up the Welland Canal, uh, turned out to be actually a British agent and uh, uh, then helped the British um, come, uh, uh, go here, uh, come here, take him as an expert witness in 1916 and 17 and uh, convict uh, uh, German agents. So um, that was Horst von der Goltz. Werner Horn uh, is um, this uh, guy that attacked Canada. So he tried to blow up a bridge in Vanceboro, Maine, um, almost blew himself up. Um, the whole thing did not work out very well for him. He ended up in a penitentiary in Atlanta and was sent back to Germany in 1919. Um, Dr. Walter Scheele down here, that was the bomb maker. Uh, so he is the inventor of these fire bombs. Uh, he fled to Cuba um, and um, Bilaski actually uh, told his agent in Havana to kidnap him, <laughs> to bring him back. And the agent who was a lawyer says, no, 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 you have to call the State Department. So that didn't work out. Um, but they got him back in 1918 and uh, he switched sides and actually became um, a, a part of the American war effort. Hans Tauscher, um, a very interesting guy, representative of Krupp Steel here in the United States and um, a big weapons and arms supplier, of course, um, a lot of the um, weapons that went into Mexico and so forth uh, were uh, were sold through him. And finally, Paul Koenig, or PK, as he was known on the street, a real street thug, uh, used to be head of the uh, detectives of HAPAC and then became the head of the German Secret Service, protected the consul uh, consulates and so forth, and um, a real thug ended up in prison briefly. Um, yeah, and then up here um, on the top right, Franz Rintelen, um, he was the guy in charge of um, uh, in charge of uh, creating labor unrest and uh, sabotage. And um, in the end, one of the biggest successes of the German sabotage campaign was, of course, blowing up the New York Harbor in the summer of 1916. And he started this. Other agents finished it for him. So I want to thank you um, for your attention. And um, uh, here are some of the books. Uh, at the top row, you have the four volumes of the FBI history. Um, so far, only the Mexican side, the first one is published. This one will come out this year, and the other two are in the works. And on the bottom, these are all, um, you can find those on Amazon, all books about the German Secret Service in North America from 1908 to 1917. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, let me let me uh, answer them. Great. All right, thank you very much. It's a uh, quite a cast of characters here, <laughs> isn't it? As you can see. Um, so, you know, I I always liked that the uh, British 
you so many of the uh, Czech nationalists uh, who had so many interesting jobs uh, working with German and Austro-Hungarian and offices and diplomatic offices and so on. Um, and I know they really relied upon them quite a bit. Yeah. Hmm. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I have a comment. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, very good. By the way, an excellent presentation. Absolutely fascinating. Um, my area of specialization, or one of them, is uh, Irish military history. Mm -hmm. And as you undoubtedly know, uh, one of the um, important aspects of the 1916 Easter Rising was efforts to uh, enlist German aid, uh, which was successful in a sense that the Germans did have an arms shipment sent to Ireland, unsuccessful because the British Royal Navy intercepted it, uh, so it was never landed there. But most of the contact between um, the Irish Republican Brotherhood in, in Ireland uh, assisted by uh, another Irish uh, Irish American nationalist group, Clonda Gale, uh, was through New York. Yes. Uh, so they would come to New York, and of course, this is before the United States enters the war, and in turn, they would contact uh, people at the German embassy, like Bernstein, and they in turn would um, uh, send them off to like Norway, uh, to get to Germany. Uh, and, and that's how that sort of thing sort of went on. So you, you probably, you probably know more about it than I do actually, but I well, just wanted to mention that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a fascinating aspect. Um, again, you know, this was one of the strategies is to support, um, movements that were against the British. And, um, so Germany actually made a deal, um, with, uh, Roger Casement and, uh, McGarrity, um, to support their uprising. And, um, there was a German agent, Walter, Hans Walter Böhm, who was actually um, in charge, first was trying to blow up railroads against Canada, but uh, they sent him in April 1915, they sent him to Germany, and he was in charge of training the Irish Brigade, uh, which was right. basically yeah. recruits uh, from German prisoner of war camps. Um, <laughs> but here is the here is the interesting thing. So we all know it failed miserably, right? And, and Roger Casement <laughs> was arrested and, and executed. Um, in New York, um, after um, von Papen was sent home, um, a guy took over his office. His name was Wolf von Eagle. So, uh, Mark, you probably have heard of him. <laughs> and, um, and von Eagle was, of course, immediately shadowed by uh, the Czechs and also by the Bureau. And, um, and so they raided his office after a few months. And uh, there's this incredible fight. He's screaming and yelling and um, lunging at the agents and trying to close this, this uh, safe that he had um, <laughs> with important documents in them. And Paul, this is the, the interesting part about the Irish uprising. In this safe, uh, the American agents found uh, the plans of, um, of the Irish uh, Easter Rising. And um, so they gave that to the Brits. So in a sense, it was actually something that happened in the United States uh, that might be one of the main causes why this uprising failed. That's fascinating. Thank you very much. By the way, uh, hopefully I can get your email so that we can maybe talk a little bit more about this. Love to. Absolutely. Anybody else? Any other questions? I have a question, but I don't think I can get through. We can hear anybody you. Hear? Anybody hear me? Hear. Yes. Mm -hmm. Finally figured it out. Uh, what was the impact of the fatherland in the propaganda war? So the father. So first of all, it was um, uh, uh, you know that was uh, uh, Sylvester Fierick's uh, publication. So what came out when the briefcase uh, contents were published in the world? One of the things that came out is that. Um, the German government actually paid Fierek and owned the fatherland. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we should explain what the fatherland is to most people. people so the don't fatherland, know it. Yeah, so it's, it's basically a, um, uh, a, uh, a weekly magazine on paper that was um, in English language. So you had lots of German language uh, publications, but the fatherland was actually English language. 
um, and um, and and uh, you know basically uh, did a good job in terms of propaganda until it became clear that it's actually owned by the Germans, uh, just like the Providence Journal was actually owned by the Brits. You know, so so um, that kind of blunted it. But um, and, and as you know, you know, Firek uh, was um, discredited um, badly, and then. Um, you know, had another rising uh, later in 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 the World War II history. Yeah. Well, I'll just have to say it's a real nice, a, a, a really interesting talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Herbert. Let me just uh, second that opinion. It was a great talk. A very interesting part of World War One we don't normally focus on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And let me mark also. Let me just say publicly here. Um, Thank you for taking over and, and stepping in to become leader of the uh, Eastern chapter so that we can continue to have meetings over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. So 